Yes, let's go to the introduction of payments. I think most people over here are from uh, civil engineering background. Is there anyone else from the other departments? Yes, which department you're from? Mechanical engineering. Oh, okay, nice. Anyone else? Okay, so the general background is like, uh, there are two different types of payments. The first is the flexible payments, which is made of uh, asphalt materials. And the second one is the concrete payment which is which we call it as rigid payments. But there are like uh, many other types of payments as well. In Netherlands and in uh, Singapore, we use a different type of payment called uh, ZOA, which is the porous asphalt. The por in the porous asphalt, whenever there is a rain, the water will just seep in through it, and the uh, friction would always be better for the entire time. In such a way, you can uh, reduce the accidents. Then there is something called uh, block payments. This is the picture from uh, Delft Center. And uh, the fifth one is the plastic roads, which is again an interesting concept which people are working on. So this is more like a slab, ready-made slab. They will just uh, place it in front of the, place it on the base materials or the sub-base materials. You can even see a trial section in front of our uh, department or 10 meter stretch. It has its pros and cons, but we will study it in detail. Yes, the final one, which we call it as a semi-flexible pavement or semi-rigid pavement. It has both asphalt and it has cement asphalt. This has its unique applications in the bus stops and in the aircraft taxiways. Yes. People think that uh, our clients are just uh, highway agencies, but we have like uh, very good agencies from the very good clients from the airports. This is, a, this is the airport from Singapore. And it has a unique set of problems. Many airports have a unique set of problems. This one is construct, being constructed on a reclaimed land. And uh, there are like a lot of different types of loads which we need to analyze for uh, each and every airports or the other things. Yes, the second one is again like we have clients from uh, bridges. The third is the four terminals. In fact, your assignment today is connected to the last uh, course. Yes, coming back to the flexible and rigid payments. Most probably, you would know the load distribution for flexible and rigid. The flexible, it will just bend and transfer the load, whereas for the rigid payment, it will act as a slab and transfer the load like that. This is again a bit basic thing. Yes, now we need to understand the distresses, we call it as diseases, or the flexible payments. These flexible payments have a lot of different diseases. We have to be able to understand each and every disease, then we can be able to cure the diseases for the roads. The first one is bleeding, it's more like uh, the asphalt material will come on top of the surface and it can lead to skidding and uh, reduction in the light. We are not going to uh, discuss each and every distress, but uh, we are going to see some of the important ones, like the pollution aggregates due to the traffic conditions, then potholes, traveling. Traveling is a very common uh, distress in the Netherlands for the porous asphalt. Yes. Let's have a small slide of this on uh, different loads. Okay, never mind. Then uh, we will we'll make like a discussion. What do you think are the reasons for all these diseases? There could be like many factors. What do you think would be the factors? What is causing all these diseases? Yes. Temperature. Temperature. Yes. Any other factor? Yeah. Moist. What? Moist. Moisture. Yeah. Yes. Subsidence. Subsidence, yeah. What do you mean by subsidence? Room in the ground. Yes, ground, uh, ground soil deformation, yes. Any other factors? Yes. Fatty. Fatty due to? Due to uh, Yes, that's, uh, that's our culprit. Traffic loading is our culprit. Any other factors you could think of? Yes. I think you have covered pretty much all the different elements. <laughs> the first culprit is the sun, of course. It will create aging and it will create the problems. 
rain. If I point around the moisture, wind. Wind is also creating some, some kind of problem. If, the, if there is a heavy wind, the temperature will be less on the pavement surface. If the temperature is high or low, again the lifetime would be dependent on the, those parameters. Moisture, humidity, water table, temperature and freeze. But the biggest culprit is the traffic. It's not a, it's not a static loading, it's also like a dynamic loading which will have a significant effect on the pavements. We have a lot of different types of uh, vehicles and the number of repetitions and uh, yeah, the position of wheels, everything is affecting the pavement life. It again creates the shear force, again the friction would also come into picture. <coughs> yes. Now again a small activity. This is just a small model which I developed in my PhD for uh, the tire and pavement interaction. Now the question is, uh, what do you think the contact area between the tire and the pavements? Uh, yeah, so what do you think would be the shape of a uh, tire and the uh, pavement? Rectangular. Yes. Rectangle, is there any other shapes you could think of? What could be the tire? Oval. Oval. Anything else? Yes, there are like a lot of different combinations. Uh, it can be something like this. It can be like a, something like this. So the first step in the pavement modeling is to get the contact patch right. So this, I, I spent almost like one year time in uh, getting the right contact patch for the pavement model. So, yes. This is a contact patch which we can uh, get it from the experiments. People call it as vein vein motion sensors, which can predict the stress and the exact contact patch. So, there are two important parameters when it comes to the contact patch. The first one is the loading and the tire pressure. So whenever there is a high tire pressure, it will create more damage to the pavements. When, whenever there is a high load, it will not create the problem. It will create a problem in a different way, but it will increase the contact patch. Then the stress will be less. You can clearly see the difference from uh, the first one, the first figure or first stroke. When you increase the load, contact patch is increasing, and when you reduce the pressure, the contact patch is again increasing. Yes, this is what we get in the simulation models. Then, uh, yes, we shouldn't again go for the very low tire pressure as well. It will again create a different kind of problem. It will not be comfortable for the vehicles either. Yeah, so we have like different types of uh, tire patches, but for our ease of computation, people started using the circular tire patch. In that way, they will be able to get the radius of this tire patch and plug it into the simulation models or personal equations or different empirical equations. So how do we get this equation? It's just the stress by strain, so stress by area and they are trying to get the radius. This is the load, tire pressure, and area. In this, we need to calculate the area. Area is pi r square. Then you just plug it in, you'll get the radius of the contact patch. Yes, once you, once you understand the single tire effect, you need to understand the multiple tires as well, the vehicle as a whole. So FHWA has classified the vehicles into 30 different ways. The first one is the motorcycles and the uh, last 13 class is like uh, multi-trailer or seven or more axle trucks. Most of the times, motorcycles and the passenger cars are like uh, mosquitoes. It will not have any effect. 
So our major problem is always the drugs. Once you are able to estimate the number of drugs, then you can design the paper. If you are able to get the exact details of the smaller vehicles, it's okay. Otherwise, you always focus on the larger vehicles or the trucks. It also has like multiple axles. You can notice the single axle or the dual axles. Or the tandem axle as well, like three axles or four axles. But most probably people will not get the higher axle details. So, look, yeah, this is such a unique situation. I don't know whether you can see it clearly due to the lighting, but uh, yeah, this is again like uh, on the hilly terrain. How will there be a load distribution? Like if there are like multiple axes, ten or twelve axes with a heavy loading. Again, you need to understand the problem. Like in the paper engineering, static load is more dangerous compared to the dynamic loading. So if the vehicle vehicle is moving very slow in the hilly terrain. The stress, the stress distributed on the flexible pavement would be totally different. This could create more effect on the pavement structures, but nobody bothers to investigate this effect. <laughs> yes. These are all the more uh, uh, higher levels of uh, axles from uh, yeah, 5, 6, 7, even up to like 10 different axles. Uh, one professor at uh, Texas a &M, they studied the effect of multiple axles on the payment performance. If you are interested, you can have a look at this study. Yes, now our objective, uh, maybe a, th this class has like uh, four small activities. Maybe you could uh, distribute this.
This is what's standard Axel. And if you're having any kind of uh, heavy truck, like the class 13 trucks, the road will be cut very fast. So it would be something like this. So our answer is like, we will keep a threshold value. We will always have a lower level of uh, value, something like 2 or 2.5. Then, if you know the number of repetitions of uh, each and every vehicle to achieve the same level of degradation of the payment structure, then you can calculate the diesel factor. Just, just the number of applications of uh, standard axle over the number of applications of test axle. Test axle can be anything. It can be passenger cars or different types of trucks. So it's always like converting to this point. Got it? Yeah, so people have created a design charts, design tables for easier conversion. In this, if you look at this, the first uh, column is the axial load, which is its pillow box. And uh, PT is the payment serviceability index. They keep recalling us, they mentioned it as 2.5. And the structure number is the stretch of the loads. If the structure number is 1, it is very bad. If the structure number is 6, it's a very good payment structure. We will cover the structure number in detail in the module A and module B. But for the sake of understanding, it's just uh, easier and uh, it's a good payment and a bad payment. So, our first task is like uh, converting this single truck into a standard axle. If you look at this uh, spot paper, the first slide, it should be says like uh, compute the easel of this particular truck on a flexible payment. Again, fle flexible and rigid payment has like, different types of tables. This particular truck has one single axle and uh, two tandem axles. The single axle is having like nine hips and tandem axle is having like 32 hips. Can someone say the equivalent single load for this particular truck? You can look at the table. First table is for single axle, the second table is for random axle. You, calc you get the value for each axle and plug it into this easel load and get the final easel load. You have the number is increasing. No, that's true. You want the value? Yeah. Can you explain one more time what PSI means? Yes. PSI is the payment serviceability index. It, it represents the quality of the road. It, may, it ranges from very bad to very good. The road, if there is like a road which you cannot even travel, you call that uh, road as PSI of zero. If the road is extremely good, which is fine. This, this is more of a qualitative term for uh, ESI. So, so that's why you say you started five, and then yeah. when it tracks, it goes down easier. Or so it's like if the road is constructed, the initially the condition would be very good. Then it will slowly degrade, and it will reach the terminal stage. That's why we call it as uh, reducing from five to two or less than that. Okay, due to the time limitation, we'll go on to the, uh, let me go to the answer. Yes. 
So you got taking the table and then you're getting the answer for single axle and parallel axle will get the piece of more. Yes? For the tandem axle, if you say there are two kids, is that the total or? It's, a, it's actually from the on each axle. So the total weight is 6.4. Total is 6.4, yeah. Single axle in the, with the uneven axle loads, you can uh, just take the, the middle of between the, the eight and the ten between the twenty. Yes, you can get the eight. You can get between eight and ten and integrate the. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Why do you take eighty zero eighty nine, which corresponds to four, and that you take that number two times? So here the structure number is given as four. So look at the SN four. Mm -hmm. For uh, 32 kids. Oh, SM is 4. It's 0.85. Yeah. Yeah. I think I have a little bit more. So there is one more uh, student activity. This is again, like I will just explain the case. So here it is, you are given the different types of access. Okay. Ranging from four single axles, four clips of six single axle, ten clips of single axle. Each has like a number of passes of like a five million or one million. You just have to get the excel factor from the table, multiply the number of passes, and we'll get the excel load. Then you add everything together, you'll get the total design piece of Here are the results. Yes, this is again a unique situation which has like a multiple axles with a Complete grader. This kind of heavy loading having has a significant effect on the payment line. Yes. What are those kips then for? Uh, kilo pounds. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Once you know the initial air traffic loading, you need to uh, you need to get something for the growth rate. Growth rate of the vehicles in the next 20 years or 30 years for which you are designing the road. This is again a little bit of assumptions you have to make. It can be like 1.5 percentage or 2 percentage. Then you have to bring in two more parameters, which is the lane distribution factor and the directional distribution factor. If there are number of lanes, like four or five, you have to reduce the traffic which is being used on a single every lane. For this, we have a equation. In this, the W0 is the initial year profit loading and uh, W is the design profit loading. For incorporating the growth rate and the number of years, we use the geometry progression, which is 1 plus R to the power n minus 1 by R. Then for the directional distribution pattern, if, there are, if uh, the road is being used for two-way, reduce the profit by single time, reduce the profit by two, and very similarly for the number of lanes as well. Yeah. Now we go to the concept of payment design. There are like three important payment design concepts. The first one is the industry approach or the empirical approach, in which people would be like uh, laying the road section, testing it for millions of, uh, uh, of trans applications, then find out whether the, how the degradation happens. This will take a lot, lot of time, but uh, yeah. The second one is the research based approach. So in the research based approach, we always use the Rosalind equations or the final element modeling to figure out what's the lifetime of the <laughs> structure. But neither is uh, good enough. We are not able to find the good results from the empirical approach or from the mechanistic approach. So we need some kind of a pseudo mechanistic approach, which lies a little bit between these two concepts to find out the exact uh, results. We are slowly moving towards the mechanistic approach, but still we need more research in both the domains. We will cover the pseudo mechanistic approach in uh, module A and module B for transport engineering. Yes, the first empirical approach. This is right after the World War II. The soldiers were free, and the government asked it to construct the road structure and asked it the soldiers to pass on the trucks for millions of time just to observe the degradation of the roads. That's how people uh, found the 
payment services in index. They took, they took so many years to find out how much wrong it takes to be paid. But yes. wouldn't that mean that the trucks like on this like small portion of road decrease their speed and that somehow bring, uh, brings a lot of uncertainty in the outcome? Yeah, yeah. it's just like uh, a single truck would be traveling the payment structure, something like this. Yeah. And uh, okay. they would be able to find the deviation. But it's, it was more of a conservative <laughs> way to predict the payment plan. It has its own limitations. We cannot predict the climatic conditions or moisture and other parameters. It's just to incorporate the traffic loading. Again, it is specific to the location. The design charts were mainly made in the US and UK. We cannot use it every day. Then, uh, yeah, it looks something like this. Yeah, in, uh, in our lab, we, are, we have the equipment something like this. It's under construction now. So this one again will pass on for uh, thousands of times or more than that. Yes, something like this. Then you will be able to determine the design life of the different <laughs> materials under different conditions. Yes. Next one is the mechanistic approach. In this mechanistic approach, we will always try to get the, identify the different traffic loading and uh, try to get the deflections, stress and strain, include the pedic life. Again, it has a lot of assumptions. It's again like more conservative nature, like we design something for this, we don't know the future things, just design for whatever the truck volume, predicted truck volume, and uh, let's see like how long it will take to be great. So the initial method was, uh, yes? Do you always use the single axle load for research purpose? People are using that single axle for the research but purpose. But like in the laboratory, have you just showed? Yes, that's a good question, yeah. We could make note of it, yeah. They are having like single axles. We could, have, we could include more axles to find out what's the effect of uh, multiple axles on the road structures. Yes, that's a, yeah.
Yes, we are not going to see in detail for the Bosnian equations. I think most people would be familiar with the classical soil mechanics theories. So now we are going to analyze the limitations of these methods. What are all the assumptions which we had and the limitations of these particular methods? How is this useful to the paper engineers? We are going to, we can, actually we can directly calculate the stresses and strains of uh, different elements using this method, but uh, we are always focused on the distresses, not the stresses. Distress is the pavement deformation or the degradation. Yes, now I'll, uh, we'll have like two minutes time to, you can discuss with your colleagues on the different limitations of Wozniak's uh, equations and yeah, you can share. You can share with us. I don't know where to start. Yeah. Uh, well, you could think of what are all the assumptions for this uh, personal situations. It was uh, we obtained this from the five mechanics concepts. So, what do you think would be the limitations? I can give you some some. Basic assumptions it has like uh, you will always assume that yes. Should we know any of these Bosniak theory equations because you just show them to us in 10 seconds and then you know that? Yeah, so we are just, so just showing this like uh, we all already know the Bosniak equations from undergraduate topics? No, we never heard of them. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I think I will, I will make a separate video and, and share it in the right space for uh, how to derive the. What's the use of this? Uh, those basic questions. I, I did, I did, but I didn't. Of course, okay. I did. Yeah. So the basic assumptions it has are like uh, homogeneous. We always assume it to be homogeneous materials, and it's always elastic materials. Although the reality is like more of a viscoelastic nature. And uh, yeah, this is just to show that the there are some equations which you can predict. Predict the stresses and strains. <coughs> yeah, I think we'll move on to the next one. Based on this, people are deriving the two layer theory and three layer theory theories, but you don't have to worry about the two and three layer theories. Yeah. Again, the people started modeling it in the finite elements. So they were making some assumptions like converting the tire into a point load and uh, changing the dynamic loading into a static loading and trying to understand the uh, stresses and strains in different places. But uh, the problem is how to connect this to the design line. We are still trying to understand the phenomenon. Yeah, this is again the model which I developed like uh, five, six years back or tire and remote interaction from the second interacts and we include the dynamic effect as well. And uh, with respect to the moving loads, so if you assume, uh, if you take any particular element under the interflexible payment, it will always be under like a vertical stress, horizontal stress and the shear force. So how does each of this changes with respect to time? The first one, is the vertical stress. Vertical stress under the, it will always be under the compression, so it will slowly increase and then reduce. When you take the horizontal stress, you can take it at different points. At the top of the flexible pavement, it will always be under a compression, something like this. At the bottom of the flexible pavement, it will be under tension. Since it bends and transfers the load, it will be under the compression load. At the top, and tension at the bottom. <laughs> That's why you can see like a, it will increase and then again decrease. The final one is the shear stress. When the tire is traveling, it's at, the, at the beginning it will be under a compression, and again it will go into tension. It will increase in tension and uh, increase in compression and then increase in uh, tension. That's why you can see a curve like that, to the side here. And uh, yeah, people are trying to model the whole tire payments and trying to understand the stresses and strains. Then 
This is the model developed by one of our colleagues. Well, in this, they were trying to get the, they, they obtained the whole payment structure based on state scanning and image processing, trying to understand the stresses and strains. And yeah, I was also trying to do a very similar work on the state scanning and uh, getting the fire payment model. But all the fire payment models still has a lot of issues to tackle the, tackle the perspective of these conditions. So, what are all the limitations do you think again like? Uh, do you think of any limitations? The first problem I, I, I could uh, share is the higher computational time. Just for running one one simulation, it will take like at least like uh, 10 days or 20 days. Just for one, one single run in the supercomputers. So how do we get, get the uh, 1 million passes to understand the stress and stress? Again, we have a like, lot of complications with the modeling, tire, and the payment. If you look at the tire, we are using the simplest possible one, and uh, payment as well, like simplest possible one at this point of time. Still, we need to figure out the limitations with respect to this uh, modeling, finite table modeling of payments. Yeah, there's one such limitation, but I will share it in the, I will make it as a video and share it later. Then, uh, yeah, finally, that's why we are trying to use the new data science especially. This is one such study conducted by Professor Imad al Thali at UIUC. Very recent one. They were trying to model the different types of tires and trying to get the stresses and strains. Use this as an input and input to the convolution neural networks and predict the stresses and strains for different scenarios. You want you have like multiple combinations of tires, tire pressure, tire loading, with the data science, you will be able to get the results of stresses and strain for every different combination. And these are all the results. Something like uh, the first figure is for vertical loading, second is for longitudinal loading, and third is the transverse loading. If the surface, okay, if the surface of the pavement looks something like this, this is the vertical loading. This is the longitudinal loading with respect to the, if the vehicle is passing somewhere like this. And this is the transverse loading. Is this uh, a top view? What? Is this uh, a top view or a cross section? This is a top view. This is the top view. They just assume the surface layer. Very simple surface layer. So that's why you can see the vertical loading is always symmetrical. It has the Longitudinal loading is more towards the front surface and uh, yes. Why do we try to make a very highly realistic model when in reality behavior is like driving is very variable? Yes, yes. We have like a lot of uncertainties with respect to the drivers, payment conditions, payment conditions. That's why we are still trying to figure out how to use these models in the field. So that's why like, we have a like, lot of uncertainties with respect to the climate, environment, loading conditions, soil variability, yeah, and uh, many more parameters. This is again, uh, if, if you are interested to find out different models, you can check this out. Yeah, essentially people say like uh, all models are wrong, but only some are useful for the field applications. Yes, we come to the end of our lecture. I hope like, you understood a little bit on the concepts of uh, different loading and uh, payment design. I think you would be able to calculate the equivalent single axial load for uh, different combinations of tires and some limitations in the payment model. You could, you could check this out. It's, it's an interesting one. You can try to make a mind map out of it. And we also have a new embassy thesis project for uh, payment modeling. If anybody is interested, you can uh, check this out and uh, you can contact us. Yeah, you, could, you will see, uh, see us again in the uh, week 7 on the sustainability in payment engineering. And uh, yes, finally coming back to the, coming to the feedback. This is actually my first uh, lecture here at QDL and uh, some teaching 
things or evaluating my performance. So if you are, if you if you could provide some feedback, some honest feedback on uh, any of the aspects, I'll be very happy. Thank you.